Hi and welcome to tonight's live where we're going to be talking about a topic which is so important when it comes to the fertility journey but one we often really don't talk enough about and that's stress and fertility. The journey to pregnancy can be wonderful and exciting but it's also often fraught with difficulties with huge emotions, a huge over roller coaster of emotions that can be really overwhelming at times. So if you are feeling like you're struggling, you are certainly not alone. And I have, hopefully Kath can join me. Um, sorry, Kath, I'm trying to find you here. Is that my done that there? Hopefully Kath will be coming through shortly. Kath Corcoran is a conception psychologist who I often share patients with because it is such a difficult journey and the emotional side of this journey plays a huge role in helping you through and also helping to improve your fertility. So hopefully Kath can join me. I saw your request come through Kath and it said it's joined but I can't see you yet. What have I got? I'll see if I can send a request. It's actually, I think, telling me that you can't get through, Kath. It's telling me, oh, you need the latest Instagram or something to be able to join. Oh dear, are we gonna get you in here tonight? Um, let me see what I can do. Invite. I think we're going to have technical issues here, Kath. I'm not sure if you're seeing this, but I'm, I'm getting a message that Kath needs the latest version of Instagram to be able to join. Oh, two seconds. Well, hopefully Kath can join us. As I said, she's a fertility psychologist who uh, we often refer patients back and forth because of the, the gravity of this, this journey. You are making big decisions at every step of the way. Some of these decisions are taken out of your control. And so that can be a really difficult process to go through. So Kath and I have spoken offline and we wanted to share with you tonight some of the tips and tools to help you navigate this journey and navigate those roller coaster of emotions that are often felt when we go through uh, this journey. So I'll just check if we can get you in there, Kath. I'll see if I can send the request again. Yep, it's come up here. Requests. I think that I think we have some action here. I think that worked. Yay! <laughs> the joys of technology. I know, sorry. I didn't realise it wasn't up to date. That's all right. I really didn't know I was up to date either. So, But I'm glad you could join us. I was just explaining, I guess we do share a lot of patients for that reason, that both what's going on, I guess, when nutritionally and emotionally play a huge role in fertility and helping people through this this journey in general so first of all Kath tell us a bit about your journey to fertility psychology what got you specializing in this this really wonderful and you know heartwarming area but difficult area yeah I'm I'm very much about following my passion and purpose mm -hmm. uh, I've always been interested in pregnancy and birth uh, particularly since having my own children uh, I then became, uh, I suppose, passionate about empowering women to have uh, births that they wanted to have. It then flowed into encouraging women to look at their options when they're pregnant, 
uh, and empowering them through pregnancy, taking ownership of, of how they want to birth, how they want to be pregnant and work through that journey. And then it then worked back to being conscious about the conception process. Um, and so not only through um, assisted fertility, but even just natural fertility in general and, and trying to have a baby. So that's, I suppose, where I worked my, my way all the way back. But in saying that, my two of my pregnancies, so I have three children, and two of my pregnancies were very conscious about how I went about trying to conceive them. So I was already drawing in that sort of work as a psychologist and then worked it into my own life. So it's it's sort of been a, a each step along the way I've, I've added to my work through my own personal experience. Yeah, I think a lot of people I deal with in this fertility industry have usually a lovely story and very connected with their patients, which I, I know you are. So I guess firstly we'll talk about stress and fertility as in the impact of stress on fertility because I think that is something that we sort of bandy around and we know stress doesn't make us feel good. But what impact can it have on our ability to conceive? From I come from a science psych model. So uh, I'm very much ingrained in understanding the biology behind what stress is so that it's important for me to understand and to share with patients and clients around, well, what, what does stress do to our body? And thankfully, the research is really catching up. We've already got it in place with understanding it just as humans in general. We understand that stress can have an impact on our body through our hormones and through our nervous system and even physiologically when we all know we have a sore back or um, we get a sore knee or, or something physiological happens when we're stressed. What I was passionate about was really getting people to understand that you, your reproductive system also can be stressed. The mind and body are completely connected. I'm not one to, to individualise it and, and uh, I suppose break it apart into certain systems. So whatever's going on for us in our mind, in our body, uh, within our environment has an impact on all of us. And it's about understanding individually how that works for each of us. Yeah. And so what we want to talk about tonight is also some tools and strategies because stress is a natural part of this process and stress is an understandable reaction as something that we, we can't take away those huge decisions those, you know, huge things that happen, you know, when we do have failed IVF, we do just get our period again for that, you know, umpteenth time, which can be really devastating. I'd love to talk tonight about, obviously, we know the impact of stress. We know it's not good for us. But to say don't stress is really, obviously, not helpful whatsoever. What are some of the things that you talk to patients about who are struggling on this journey and are really struggling with that level of stress and those deep emotions? What tools do you use for them? Mm, yeah, really important. I think stress is also important to pull apart. There's the two aspects of understanding exactly going through the whole process of, of getting a period or things not turning out and, and feeling really overwhelmed by it. But there's also the factor of stress that we forget that we have lifestyle stress going on that can be impacting things too. So mm -hmm. it's about understanding, okay, where am I sitting with my stress levels? What can I control? What can't I control? That's the hard thing, isn't it, Tasha, around mm -hmm. when we're trying to conceive. A lot of it we can't control about the, the fertility process. And, and I think that's, that's even more anxiety provoking. So yeah. a few of the things I, I get people to pull apart is what are the things that we can actually control? Um, control the controllables. Uh, I have five pillars for everyone, not even just uh, um, for fertility. It's, it's everyone in general. I recommend five things when we're feeling stressed, what can we actually do in their um, diet, which is why I often refer to you. That's not my bag. I have information, but for your specialised area, I, I say to people, well, you have to understand nutrition and the impact on our body. So I, I refer off to you. It's about understanding our sleep and the impact that that can have, um, exercise and what we need to do about that, um, getting vitamin D and fresh air, and then meditation. They're my five things that I say you will notice significant changes within one week if you actually look at tweaking those five areas of your life. Yeah. 
I think those mindfulness practices are important to put in place. And it's not, as I always tell my patients when I refer them to yourself as well, it's not just about making you feel better. That's a lovely side effect, but it's helping on a biological level. And I often do find that I, I see a lot of type A personalities. And I think the difficulty with pregnancy is it's unlike any other challenge we have often faced in our lives and I find women come to me having faced lots of challenges they've you know really thrived in their career they've really gotten where they have gotten by you know working harder striving that bit more and so approach a fertility with that same mentality which is unfortunately it doesn't work so we really need to pedal backwards and, and change and reframe our mindset, which can be really difficult to do. So those mindfulness practices, I know there was a study in 2015, I think it was, that they looked at about 39 different trials on stress and found that implementing mindfulness and um, talk sort of cognitive behaviour uh, practices doubled the chances of pregnancy because we're looking at all those positive neurotransmitters and that impact on hormones and, and stress. So obviously control what you can control. We can we dig into some of those pillars a little bit more so that people who are listening and struggling can, you know, have some resources to walk away with. Sure, sure. Uh, so the, the big one for me is, is about understanding how sleep can impact our stress levels. Um, and even just our stress hormones. So it's about understanding that we can't push ourselves out to burning the candle at both ends, that we need to really set in place some really healthy sleep hygiene habits by going to bed at 10, maximum 10.30, um, not pushing ourselves out so that our body kicks in with the hormone of cortisol, which says, oh, hang on, you're pushing me awake. I need to be awake and not giving our, our bodies the ability to actually relax, but also detox from the day. So that's why I, I encourage sleep, looking at our sleep habits. Actually, and I know that you've talked about things before, like um, like being mindful of screen time and um, blue light and, and all those sorts of things. It's about understanding we have to, the healthy sleep hygiene is about winding down teaching our body that we have to slowly move into this rest cycle which will also bring down those stress levels with the hormones that are pulsing around our body uh, a lot of people i use the analogy it's sort of like in this modern day and age a lot of people are uh, hitting the wall like a ferrari when they hit, go to bed it's like they think okay i've got to rush around all day and then okay it's bedtime now at 10 30 11 o'clock whatever time so it's about understanding we have to work through the gears. Otherwise, you're going to be hitting the wall at, at, in, in six gear. So that's what I, I think is, is an area to even start to tweak um, from tonight. You'd be able to do that. I talk a lot about that because it is so important. And I think anyone who is you know, doing an IVF journey, I know we hear about a lot of melatonin. And it is really important that we help our body produce that natural melatonin and work in line with that circadian rhythm as we look out now it's dark but are any of us winding down we're probably not good examples on our screens talking here um, but you know we're watching tv we're scrolling instagram we are actually, as you said why some of us still working on our laptops emailing till quite late at night we're not allowing that melatonin to kick in i even yeah recommend dim the lights i mean candle lights great if you can we as you said you know i like that analogy hitting the the wall with the ferrari but i'd say as well we're bright light bright light bright light and then we just expect the body to switch off and produce melatonin and we either fall asleep stressed and exhausted <laughs> or we don't. We lay awake with that wired, tired uh, mentality. And sleep is the only time I tell my patients the body can look after eggs. It's too busy looking after brain and extremities. And that it's, you know, it's when our wee body has got that lovely melatonin, we've got that nice deep rest that our body can look after and heal some of those other aspects of our body. So, um, yeah, I love that focus on sleep. Yeah. The other one that I think why we work well together with referring is the nutrition aspect. Mm. And I refer to you because I know you know all the, all the what bits and bobs that you need to know about having amazing eggs and fertility and those sorts of things. But the reason I also refer is because for, for me as a psychologist, and it's only an evolving field, 
but I'm very much aware of the gut mind brain connection. Uh, there's only studies again, only coming out now, but it's highlighting that our gut health actually has an impact on our mental state. So that it is our second brain. So the neurotransmitters that are in the gut actually create whether we have anxious um, feelings and emotions alongside, I'm not saying we don't have cognitive thoughts about it, but we definitely have this physiological response around anxiety that some people might not even realize that they're triggering and pinging off just because of a physiological response with too much caffeine in their body or um, processed food or sugar. Um, it's about keeping an uh, awareness of what food actually can impact our neurotransmitters in our own gut. So that's why I like referring to you is because you've got all that information on how do we make sure that this person isn't getting anxious and overwhelmed or even low because of the food choices that they're making and sometimes as you said we're not aware of it so i guess we know the standard ones you know alcohol caffeine we know they can have an impact on our you know stress and energy and that sort of thing but also nutrient deficiencies or often excesses or wrong supplements or you know some overeating of certain um, things in our diet can trigger those feelings of anxiety or exacerbate i say you know they're, they're sort of low lying anyway in fertility but they can exacerbate some of those aspects and you can definitely see the brain gut connection i like to look at it the other way too and that's why we've said for years you get butterflies in your stomach and you literally do you're nervous your gut gets all churned up you may need to run to the bathroom before doing your presentation there is such a strong connection between the mind and the gut and it goes both ways and the gut is so important i know my patients probably get sick of hearing about that but in regards to diet the immune system our uterine receptivity our inflammation so much resides in the gut 70 percent of our immune system is there you know what we respond to what we react to what we tolerate what we don't our nutrient absorption so much is in that that gut that yes it is a great focus alongside the mindfulness activities that we can do lifestyle wise yeah yeah so and again it's something you can control you can tweak yeah. it and make contact with people you can read books to work out okay what will enhance my my um, journey towards fertility and conceiving a child and it, it is a small changes that you can make in a matter of days and weeks and celebrating those small changes i think there is such a a big goal when it comes to fertility and we we only look at that big goal and if we we don't achieve that big goal then we have failed and i think that's a a natural reaction but it's not a failure think, look how far you've come look what we look at the the small steps that you've made along the way and even the small progress you know it's yeah. not about doing a six-week detox i mean sometimes that's a great idea and sometimes that's good but i'd rather you do something daily to support those detoxification pathways and create that healthy environment than to do a six-week detox and then fall off the wagon because that's far too hard to sustain so as you said those small wins can be so important to, to celebrate and acknowledge to yourself completely yeah and i think that that links in with another message that i give to a lot of people and it's about trusting the process so mm. Not feeling like okay there's the end goal and I'm not getting anywhere near it trusting the process that it is bite-sized that those small changes that I'm making daily the small wins that I'm getting daily are getting me towards that point rather than feeling like okay well over there they've done all of this and that's that's working for them and why isn't it working for me mm -hmm. it's really understanding what are my small bite-sized pieces that I'm having to take yeah yeah and I love another one that you talked to me about is better in than out which I'm a big believer of as well. I think that's so important. So let's unpack that a bit and what can people do to, to help that process? Yeah. So better in than out is obviously um, talking about it, t talking about your feelings, talking about the emotions. A big one for me, obviously, is I provide that space for people so that they can feel safe to talk about every single emotion that they're feeling a lot of this is, I suppose, one of the things that really keeps me driving home and being passionate about empowering people. A lot of the issues that, that we face with infertility around, um, around just not being fertile or it not happening at that point in time, around miscarriage, around loss, um, even around menstrual cycles, a lot of this stuff is taboo. Mm. I want people 
be able to have a safe space. They can talk about any of this stuff that they want to talk about. I mean, we even get hushed if we talk about sex too loud. So mm -hmm. I want people to be able to talk about all of this stuff in a safe space that they can go, okay, I'm seeing Kath, can talk about whatever I feel like. There's no judgment at all. And I can really get these feelings out that are sitting, sometimes they're sitting really low, deep down because they've had no one to speak to about this. So that's important. But I think even just something they can do themselves is journaling. I, I know a lot of people screw their noses up and it's like, I don't want to journal. And it's not a dear diary entry. It's purely just getting out all these feelings and emotions that are, uh, are, are just swir swirling around in our mind. And it's getting it out and getting it out on paper so that we don't have to fill our brains with the rumination i think a lot of people experience rumination with fertility issues and it's because it's like i can't change this i can't fix this how do i do it normally we have an answer we can find a way to problem solve infertility has a lot of challenges whereby it's just ruminating on is there another way around so getting it out on paper actually just is a circuit breaker for a little while yeah i'm big on that i get my patients to do what i call the morning pages and as I don't like to call it journaling because you're right, some people have that reaction to journaling even myself. So just getting it out on paper, I actually do mine at night. So it doesn't really matter when you do it, but writing three pages and I make them write three pages. It even can be anything, just literally write, I don't feel like doing this today. This seems really silly. I think I'm, you write the three pages to start to get into those subconscious things that you may find yourself writing that you didn't even know were there because we don't, talk to ourselves i think it's great if you can get the help and support of someone like yourself who provide that space and can really be structured and empathetic and give you that support around it but at least as you said getting it out on paper and talking to yourself having mm -hmm. that little conversation with yourself on paper even if it doesn't make sense initially if you can keep digging into that you can get some of those underlying layers and i even say if you keep writing ask the questions in your writing. You'll probably find some of those answers come through. How do I really feel about that? What should I do? And sometimes those answers can come through in your own writing because you, as you said, it was going round in circles up here. We need the circuit breaker to stop that and just get those feelings out onto paper instead of swelling around in your head, which always feels so much worse. Completely. And I think that it's also about understanding that while we're ruminating, we're, we're trying to manipulate our thoughts on how do we think about this and what do I need to do? It. It's, it's really concentrated. Whereas when we're journaling and writing down, the same as meditation, it gives us the space to drop into an area that we've got vacant, that it's about allowing thoughts that we're not specific and getting conscious on that we want to think it's about opening the box a little bit and saying hang on there's stuff here that I can allow to drop in without thinking that I can fix it all by being so direct and detailed about the the thought that I think I need to have and as you said allowing those feelings to be there and flow through you I think there is Obviously, it's a taboo subject in some ways. We don't talk about it. We don't want to share it with friends. But it can even be taboo with yourself. You yeah. feel like opening that box is a scary place. If I go into that box, what am I going to find? What do, am I going to lose myself in that box and go into this hole? And I always say, emotions pass. They are always there. They can be massive. They can sideswipe you. But getting them out on paper and allowing them to flow through you, I think I saw a post here, like there's, there's no gang of emotions out to get you. They will flow through you if we can use some supportive tools to get them out and allow them to be freed. Then we can get a whole new level of, of I guess, de-stressing that, was often causing a level of anxiety that I have patients say, I just feel on this heightened level of anxiety all of the time. And they, it's really even hard to articulate, I guess, the why to that. So helping to just get that out on paper and allowing that those feelings to throw, flow through them. And another post I saw, which I always come back to and I love, um, that you don't have to believe your thoughts. Yes. And that was in it kind of an epiphany to me I think as in well what's in my head that that's me I, I must believe what's going on in my head but our mind can lie to us all the time 
as humans, we, we naturally, for some reason, jump to the negative. We can be really hard on ourselves. So getting those out onto paper can make them seem, you can read them for what they are. You can be, I find, slightly more objective when you're reading some of those thoughts as to when they're floating around in your head, just making you feel worse and worse. So actually stepping away from those and just seeing them as thoughts, not who you are and who your life is. Completely. And I think a lot of people have been conditioned to, to be fearful of, of, of what's coming rather than mm -hmm. actually be open to experiencing whatever it is coming forward. We get so conditioned as a child to be fearful of the unknown. So when our thoughts are coming out, it, we do jump to the, well, it has to be fear-based because we're so conditioned that way. So you're right. As soon as we're able to see it down on paper, we can actually question that and say, hang on, is that my thought or is that my ego space and my fear sitting there saying, mm -hmm. oh, no, we're going to make you worry about something when really it's about just sitting in the space of I know I'm okay. I think some people even feel more comfortable, not that they want it, but that it's just more natural to know that there's something to worry about rather than sitting in the space, there might be nothingness right now in your process. It doesn't mean that nothing is happening. It just yeah. means that you have to allow, um, sort of put to the side any fear that might be trying to keep, creep in and say, no, hang on a minute. I know where I am in my path and my process. I don't have to fill it with that anxiety just because I don't know what to feel. And that's where I think getting the support from people like yourself and myself can really help because I think a lot of the time, even the stress is kind of, it feels productive. Yes. If I want to move ahead in my fertility journey, at least thinking about it and stressing about it and thinking about my next steps and going over things 20 times in my head, surely that's productive use of time towards my fertility journey. If, if I forget it, if I go and have fun and, and do something else, then I mustn't be moving in that direction anymore. And that's not yeah. the case at all. You are moving forward. I often use the analogy of a, a still pond. You know, that's often what we see. It feels like we're going nowhere, that there's just no movement. But there's so much life underneath there. There's so much we're doing, you know, all of our mindfulness practice, those things we're doing daily that we don't see the difference. I wish we could, you know, a patient asked me the other day, how can I tell that my eggs are getting better? I'm like, I so wish we could just, you know, put a microscope in there. Actually, as my daughter said the other day, she knows I obviously help people get pregnant. And she said, Mommy, when I get bigger, I am going to invent a telescope so that you can go into their bellies and find their babies for them. And I thought, oh, that is so beautiful. I so wish I could do that and at least even see the difference that, you know, the changes that we're making have. And it's, it's great speaking when we're doing IVF and speaking with the embryologist, you can, you know, see the difference. And, but if we're trying naturally or sometimes it's really hard to actually see the difference. So, yes, just often feels like we're stagnating, but lots is happening. It's not stagnation, it's stillness. Completely. And even just I get people to re remember the, the symbolism and, um, and the analogy of, of our seasons. <clears throat> we don't know what's going on during winter, but there's plenty going on because what happens in spring? And it's about mm. understanding that and following that. The same as the stillness, the same as the, the seasons, understanding we can't always see the work that's going on, but, but ha we have to follow the process, trust the pro process, and, and we'll find that, that there is an outcome there. Yeah, so... Well, thank you for sharing these amazing tips and tools that I know it is is so important to help people navigate this journey from an emotional perspective, obviously, for improved fertility, but also just improvement in life quality and relationships. You know, infertility can affect every part of your life, really. You know, your relationships with your partner, with yourself, with work colleagues, so much is impacted by this journey, which can be all-consuming. So... Is there any other tips that you would like to leave us with? I know we went through five. We'll make sure we've covered all of the five things. And I think we've covered, I think there was two more that, we, that we've often discussed that I thought we might just touch on before we wrap up. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. So um, reviewing um, your life or life review, mm. it's about understanding that we're, our focus right now is on fertility. And sometimes it's about understanding that, there might be other stresses in our life 
or other issues, sorry, that are causing undue stress in our life that mm -hmm. we really need to either eliminate, to put to the side, to maybe uh, so many people I see, fertility actually brings up issues that they want clarity in their life around that they need to make a massive shift on. And and the fertility is the, is the breakthrough for them to because they've got something to say, no, hang on a minute, I'm so passionate about wanting to achieve this, other things now have to be relegated or reprioritised. Mm -hmm. So it might be work, it might be um, relationships with parents, it might be relationships with siblings, it might be um, even just uh, concepts such as boundaries. So that, I think that's important, even checking in with yourself and saying, hang on a minute, is there something that's a bit of a... A thorn in my side right now that is actually causing me undue stress that is taking away from me being able to really immerse myself in being able to conceive and have a family right now and I would say at least 50 to 60 percent of people have got something else going on that they have to probably resolve. Mm. Yeah, I think it's important, as you said, to look at those things. I think we tend to be so focused on the goal that we keep going and going and going and going and doing and doing. And I know I'm a doer as well. I'm a culprit of that. So it's really hard to yeah, think, step back and I guess survey what's going on and look at it more objectively and what can we do to help you achieve that, that goal, I guess, more in a more streamlined way. And I know the other thing that you talk about is gratitude for what, is working obviously there's a big thing that's not working and it is such a focus because it is it is all consuming um that that is not working but we tend to then forget about all the things that are working so if you unpack that just a gratitude for what is working at the moment yeah completely i think that i, I and i completely understand so many couples come in and see me and it's and it's getting really angry and resentful and and grieving about this isn't working and that's not working this process has happened and and it's not for me to dismiss that you have those feelings i i think mm. they're important to have the feelings but i think to move through it the, often the statement i use for people is to understand that we can we don't want to unpack and stay there so yeah. we can have the feeling but okay how are we going to shift and move through this because it's not healthy for for us to sit in that space and it will cause unnecessary stress whether we think about that or whether we think it will or not so mm -hmm. gratitude brings us back to that space of well what is working right now and and even if it's journaling it down okay i'm grateful that my body is receptive to the medication that i have to take I'm grateful that I was able to get an appointment in two weeks rather than a month for my um, specialist. I'm grateful that I can access healthy fruit and vegetables that some people not may not be able to access. So it's not actually dismissing that the difficult things are going on, but it's about understanding that our brain will focus and feed into whatever we want to focus on. So we have to choose our path. We, we do have control over that. So let's choose the aspect that we're grateful for. It will then actually, again, we go back to the hormones. It will flood our body with those nice, lovely, warm hormones that encourage pregnancy and encourage fertility, not the stress hormones that we constantly ruminate with and that we're angry about. We all know even if I got people to check in right now and said, is there something you're angry about and I want you to focus on it? we would immediately have feelings and emotions and, uh, and chemicals start to float through our body that will show that we're quite angry. So yeah. you, can, you can test yourself with that, with that um, experiment. So it's about saying, okay, does that actually help me with my mental health and with my body right now? It probably doesn't, focusing on that area that's not working. So let's really focus on the things that are working during this space. And does it even help with the situation? And I think that's a difficult thing is getting angry. Is getting, I wish those things helped because they're so easy to fall into and they're satisfying to do and to feel angry and frustrated and not to definitely to feel those emotions. I always say to patients, feel what you feel. Like there's no emotion that is off limits or I shouldn't be feeling that. As That's so not the case. You feel how you feel and that's totally okay. But yeah, just unpacking it and staying that in that, is that helpful to you moving towards that goal? 
it'd be nice if it was, but it, it's not. So how can we as a, use those strategies to move through those feelings into a better place and a safer place? And I know something that we've spoken about before, and I think it's probably got similar connotations to journaling, so is um, meditation. So we'll just talk about that a little bit because that can bring up similar things. And I know I'm, I do try to meditate regularly, but I'm terrible at it. So don't ask me to meditate for an hour. I get my probably 15 minutes and that's about it. I'm not good at sitting still, but I know how important it is. And so I like to give people strategies of how they can implement it in their life, regardless of how they are, even if they are like me and struggle to, to sit still, how they can implement that in their life without having to feel like you know you've got to be in a zen tent and meditate for an hour what are some of the things that you can let people know that they can introduce this into their daily lives yeah sure so uh, meditation yeah definitely i'm a big big fan of meditation even to the point that i place myself in a center that is mindfulness and meditation at, at a place to be in albert park so um so so important studies show that meditation can have a massive impact physiologically not even just mentally physiologically Mm. 15 minutes meditation actually is equivalent i think i've seen to an hour of sleep or something similar to that so the things i get people to include it's connecting meditation to something within your life that you would regularly do so you would do it in the morning or at night is easier to slip into your day because it's like brushing your teeth so okay i've got a routine i have my cup of tea i brush my teeth i'll jump into bed and i'll put my meditation on it's about uh, connecting to a meditation app that works for you or a, a for a way in which it's delivered that works for you so I often recommend Insight Timer because you can choose everything in that app that you want, how long you want to go for, what type of meditation, whether it's male or female, what language it is. So there's so many more options around that. But there are other ones, um, uh, Headspace, um, Smiling Mind. um, You can find Spotify meditation playlists. So it's about picking what works for you it's and that's really important it's trial and error i know that Mm -hmm. i didn't like and it's nothing against smiling mind but i didn't like it because it was a a man speaking the same every day for 30 days and i'm like you're you're boring me i can't Mm -hmm. do that so that's what you have to do you have to choose what works for you um you also don't have to as you said you don't have to be in a Zen tent and and be all spiritual about things, jump on your bed, make it 10 or 15 minutes and just allow yourself that time. Um, And the the final thing um, I would suggest is uh, most people, they they feel like they're going to do it wrong. There's no Mm. wrong way to do meditation. But also if thoughts are dropping in, then that's okay. If the shopping list drops in, this is what meditation is about. It's actually about acknowledging the thoughts and then allowing them to float through. It's not sitting with that thought, though. That's, that's the practice of meditation. Okay, I'm going to move through that and let it go. That's why I find the guided meditations so helpful for them because they do give you a focus and then you can see those other, I guess, thoughts coming through, but you've got that, that voice or that focus to go through. And I quite like the muscle relaxation ones as well because you can, I even get my patients to do, I call it the 10 second body scan and it doesn't need to take 10 seconds, but I, you know, and use that analogy because it doesn't need to take long. You can sit at your desk and I've had people comment to me that, they're amazed at how much they clench their jaw during the day. Or I had one patient that just said, I just clench my fists all of the time. And so it's just when you're sitting at your desk, even that's a, like a mini meditation, just to start, you know, in, the, you know, in your eyebrows, in your cheeks, just relax all of your muscles all the way down and notice where you're perhaps holding all that tension. And you may be holding that all day, which is going to, you know, end up causing all that stress at night. So just some little things that you can implement and with the meditations, I love yeah, the Spotify and Insight Timer as well. And I do like linking it in with something. And I recommend people pop it in their Google Calendar or link it in with brushing your teeth and going to bed. I know do I do it in the mornings. But whatever works with you, that it becomes a habit. And, yeah, don't try an hour first up. Yeah. I've gone with five minutes when I first started. Just, you know, what can we do for five minutes just to sit and chill? 
and then we can gradually work up to, you know, 15 minutes, even half an hour if you have the time. Yep, completely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I hope that's helped with some of the things and, and clarifying some areas of meditation and what it is and what it isn't, uh, which I think is so important. So is there anything you would like to leave us with today to help those people struggling? Hopefully we've got lots and lots of tools, but anything we haven't covered today that you'd like to, to go through? I've touched on a lot. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, we have touched on so much. Um, look, uh, I think that it's important even as a psychologist that although I'm identifying different areas for people to work on, I often describe it like a fingerprint that people's fertility journey is individual. So it's really important to, to take stock and pull apart what are the areas for me that are the issues. Some people might be fine with their sleep. Other people really have to focus on their nutrition. So even just being honest with yourself about saying, okay, well, what are the areas that might be helpful for me to focus on and work through? But also understanding when you are seeking help that it's not for me as a psychologist, it's not stock standard, okay, someone's coming for fertility issues and, and I'm going to tick off certain things. I don't approach it that way. Every person that comes to me will have a nuance in what their difficulty is or what their issue is. Um, some people might have more of a psychological underpinning that these these strategies are great and important, but I think it's also really helpful to unpack some of the psychology that might be going on for the person, whether it be the type A sort of lifestyle that isn't always helpful. It might be about healing um, parent-child relationship issues. It might be about understanding, as I said before, boundaries. So certain psychological themes come up in fertility that people – don't realize can have an impact on their mental health and well-being so that's important even if you want to touch base with me and say this is going on for me do you think it might have an issue and i'm happy to say possibly this might be going on and and then we can go from there so uh, i think that's probably an important part I, I think as well i agree everyone's different in their fertility journey and i think it is so important to impact some you know unpack some of these things i know some of the patients that I have seen and seen through in, into healthy pregnancies have had a big major shift of some degree and they've almost realised after, okay, that was meant to happen. I, I actually didn't realise I needed to clear that. It was horrible and icky and, and messy. But now that we're through that, I can see why it needed to happen and this is where we are now. So... Now, just got a little question there that is recorded. I will post this to IGTV. So, yes, make sure you pin this and save it because we've covered so many tools tonight that you can go back and refer to because this isn't a one-stop shop. And even if you do implement all these strategies, you can fall off the wagon. You will fall off the wagon. <laughs> Everyone does. Uh, get the support you need, get the help you need, pin this, refer back to it and put some of these strategies in place, which I hope is really helpful for you on your journey. So thanks so much, Kath, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to share your wealth of wisdom on this topic with us today. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Tasha. I really thanks, appreciate Kath. it. Bye. Bye.